Culture in Namibia is a blend of many different people and its culture and customs have absorbed both African and European elements and fused them into a blend of the two. Although the country is urbanizing rapidly, a majority of Namibians still live in rural areas and lead largely impoverished lives. It is among these people, however, that cultural traditions survive most strongly. Let us look at Namibian ethnic groups and their culture. It is important to note that, they are not arranged in in any special order. At number one, we have the Awambo people. The Awambo people are synonymous with Namibia and are the largest cultural sector found in the country, representing half of the total population. Concentrated mostly in the north, the Awambo consist of subtribes namely the Ndanga, Kwanyama, Kwambi, Gangela, Balano, Kalankati, and Baja. The Awambo people are a resourceful and productive tribe and are active in all areas of the economy from agriculture and fishing to trading. They cultivate maize, sorghum, beans, melons, onions and mahango, a type of millet. They fish when the low-lying areas fill with water from Angola and then drive their cattle onto the fertile grazing lands which are left behind when the waters subside. Manure produced by these cattle is used to fertilize their crops which are cultivated on the higher ground where the floods do not reach reach. They are keen traders and kuka shops and food markets are plentiful wherever the Awambos are found. Home industries selling clothing, carvings, pottery and baskets are another favorite business venture of the Awambo, particularly the womenfolk. Most Awambo families are involved in retail activities of some kind and many have extended their enterprises further into Namibia and beyond to Angola. Before colonization, the Awambo society consisted of a king and his headmen in each of the Awambo groups and although succession was matrilineal, the king had the final say in all matters. The women were responsible for cultivating the land and raising the children while the men attended to the cattle and important tribal matters. Traditional homesteads consisting of palm huts enclosed with wooden pole fences can still be seen in some places and the Nakambale Museum and traditional village is a good recreation of a traditional Awambo crawl. This facility is also an example of community-run accommodation in Namibia, where the local tribesmen own and manage the facility. At number two, we have the Kavango. En route to your accommodation in Namibia you will notice a thriving roadside trade in beautiful wood carvings, baskets, clay pots and ornaments. The carvings are largely the work of the Kavango men who are skilled at transforming the dolphwood of the Kalahari Sandveld into a variety of ceremonial drums, musical instruments and household items, while the women weave baskets and make clay pots and ornaments, which they sell to visitors with grinning enthusiasm. These people reside in the Kavango region of northern Namibia on the Angolan border along the Kavango River, which is named after them. The river is pivotal to their survival and they grow crops on the narrow strip of fertile soil alongside it, graze their cattle on the floodplains, fish the river extensively and hunt the wild animals that live there. Five tribal groups, each headed by a king, can be distinguished amongst the Kavango and these kingdoms are further grouped into clans and matrilineal family groups. All political, social, economic and religious functions of society are performed within the framework of these groups. The lineage consists of both male and female members, but the line of descent is only traced through females. This means that should a man hold a hereditary political position, it is passed on to his sister's eldest son and not his own children. Kavango traditional law is legitimized by the Namibian constitution. Male and female roles are traditional with the men doing the hard labor and caring for the cattle. Cattle are highly valued as a status symbol and are used for milk, meat, hides and plowing as well as rituals and animal sacrifices. Traditionally, the Kavango believe in one supreme being, Nyambai, and his cooperation is secured via prayers and sacrifices to the ancestors, and by adhering to a wide range of religious prohibitions e.g. food taboos, incest taboos, and various other prescriptions. Magic plays an important part in the everyday lives of the Kavango people and diviners and medicine men are highly respected even though most of the Kavango now practice Christianity. Number 3. 3. Herero People the Herero people, it is believed, moved to Namibia from the eastern African region, to the region around Lake Tanganyika. According to their oral history they came down from a lush area, with much water and grass, but about 350 years have passed and they have since acclimatized nicely to the dry Namibian environment. Today they are a pastoral cattle breeding nation, mostly living in the central and eastern parts of Namibia. 
The much celebrated cultural diversity of Namibia is made all the richer by their presence, the Herero are a strong and proud culture and the observance of that culture continues despite the near decimation of the entire Herero population in Namibia's colonial wars. One beautiful aspect of Namibian culture is the holy or sacred fire, which is kept burning and where prayers are made or important ceremonies like weddings are held. The sacred fire also plays an important role in ancestor worship, still a part of Herero culture. The sacred fire, while not as prevalent as it was before European missionaries arrived in Namibia, remains burning in many rural villages to this day. Another distinct feature of the Herero culture is the dress of the women, which pays homage to the importance of cattle farming to the Herero people. Women wear a horn-shaped hat made from a rolled cloth, the horns stretch out horizontally on either side of the head. Otherwise their dress is quite distinctly and interestingly Victorian, a relic that stretches back to the days of German missionaries and colonialists' wives. The dress consists of crinoline that is worn over petticoats. These dresses are considered to be the proper dress for married Herero women. Every year a traditional Herero festival is held, it always falls on the last weekend in August and is held in Okahanja. At this festival paramilitary groups parade before the chiefs and women line the streets proudly wearing their beautiful bright traditional dresses and hats. The cultural identity is strong and represents a great deal of not only the past of the Herero but also the past of Namibia. Have you come into contact with other culturally rich people? If you have, then please share it with us here in the comments section. Number 4. The Caprivians the people who live in the Caprivi, also known as the Caprivi Strip, still live a life in harmony with the soil, the animals they hunt and the fish they catch. Caprivi borders Botswana, Angola and Zambia making the region fairly important geographically and politically. The Caprivi is surrounded by four perennial rivers, this density of water offers beautiful river rainforests, wetlands that boast over 600 species of bird and an incredible array of plants, trees and flowers that will keep botanists and nature lovers happy for days. As fitting with Namibian government policies the inhabitants of Caprivi manage and benefit from the ecotourism to their area, running community conservancies for tourists. A particular draw card of Caprivi is that this is home to the nearly endangered African wild dog. While there are a number of different groups of people living in Caprivi the two largest are the Masubia and the Mathwe people. The Masubia are patrilineal, which means that their kinship or ethnic identity is dependent on their father. The Mathwe people are on the other hand matrilineal, so if your mother is Mathwe, you are Mathwe. Other groups in the Caprivi include the Mei, Matatila, and the Mashi people. Subsistence farming, hunting and fishing are still the way of life. Most villages are along the river banks of the Zambezi and common crops grown are maize, millet, sweet potatoes, groundnuts, pumpkins and melons. Number 5. 5. The Himba. The Himba are today a relatively small group of no more than around 50,000 people who live in the northern region of Namibia. The Himba culture and the people themselves have survived not only the harsh climate of their land, but also war and persecution. Today their culture remains much as it was around a hundred years ago, the women still color their skin with red ochre, and the ancestral fires are still kept burning in the center of the homesteads. The Himba are a semi-nomadic people, who live a conservative life in a very isolated area. While the Himba are not cut off from Namibian development they do maintain their cultural practices and way of life. The Himba homestead is arranged in a circular shape surrounding the ancestral fire and central livestock enclosure. The Himba continue to practice ancestral worship and the fire is kept burning as a part of this belief system. The livestock enclosure too is located here to allow proper relationship between humans and their ancestors. The women decorate their skin with red ochre mixed with butter fat, and after marriage also color their braids with the mixture. Both Himba men and women braid their hair according to what stage they are in life. Children will wear two braided plates, when girls reach puberty their hair will be braided forward, with the plate covering her eyes. Single young men will have their plate braided backward. After marriage women will wear an elaborate headdress of streams of braids colored red with ochre. Married men wear a turban of plates. The Himba culture and people survived despite their harsh climate, severe droughts, and war. In the early 1900s the Germans attempted genocide on the Himba people along with the Herero, 
who they are closely related to, and Nama. Now the Himba land and culture is preserved and protected through the Namibian government's policy of conservancies. Iconic images of Himba people with their braids and reddish skin are celebrated in travel journals around the world for good reason. When next in Namibia, travel north to experience the Himba culture and landscape for yourself. Number 6, The Namas. Have a closer look at that $100 Namibian dollars banknote as you hand it over to pay for your meals, curios, or accommodation in Namibia. The face which appears on several Namibian banknotes is that of Captain Hendrik Whitboy, much admired leader of the Nama people during the first liberation struggle. Today, there are 13 tribes of about 60,000 Nama people spread throughout Namibia. Thought to be the only true descendants of the Khoikhoi, their language shares the same roots. Like the San, they are light-skinned, slightly built people. The Nama originally hail from the area around the Orange River in southern Namibia but were steadily driven northward by European farmers. In the mid-19th century their leader, Jan Jonker Afrikaner, led them to greener pastures in the area of Windhoek. Here they came into conflict with the Herero people and German colonists and were eventually resettled them in reserves set aside specifically for them. Originally nomadic cattle herders, this resettlement put paid to the Nama's wandering ways, but some aspects of their culture do remain. Most of the Nama still subscribe to communal land ownership and their rich tradition of poetry, music and dance continues. Many wonderful proverbs, riddles and poems have been passed on from generation to generation. Their tales and songs celebrate heroic figures, animals and plants and form a vital part of their society. The great majority of them practice Christianity and few are Muslims, having been converted from their original ethnic religion by missionaries. The Nama people are highly skilled artisans, so their handiwork is highly prized. They produce embroidery, applique work, leather work, carosses, mats, jewelry, flutes, clay pots and tortoiseshell items of outstanding quality and beauty. Traditionally, traditionally, the Nama women dress in long formal attire of the Victorian era which has become an integral part of their cultural identity. Number 7, the Tswana. Tswanas are the smallest cultural group in Namibia, numbering some 6,000, and are located mainly in the Gobabis district near the Botswana border. They are divided into three subgroups. The ancestors of the Tswana tribe moved to the area south of the Limpopo from East Africa during the 14th century in several separate migrations. Here they split into two groups, the Basotho of the south and the Botswana of the west. Centuries of fighting amongst themselves, decimation by the Zulus under King Shaka and fighting with white settlers dispersed the Tswana people over a large area. When the British colonized the Transvaal, the Tswana people were granted a large tract of land called the British Protectorate of Bechuanaland, which became the independent state of Botswana in 1966. Totemism is a major feature of the Tswana belief system and each member of the nation associates themselves with a specific animal, plant or object adopted in accordance with ancient myths and legends. This carries with it responsibilities and rituals which must be obeyed. Anyone contravening these rules has to undergo ritual purification to prevent bad luck. Although tribal alliances have almost disappeared, the Tswana people do acknowledge the ancestral relationship they share with others of the same totem. The family group is patriarchal, with the smallest unit consisting of a husband, his wife and any unmarried ch children. Traditionally, the family would live in a homestead consisting of one or more houses, a grain storage shed and a courtyard surrounded by a mud wall or a reed or wooden fence. Today, they have taken accommodation in Namibia that is more modern, and most of them have adopted Christianity in favor of their ancient beliefs. Number 8, The Damaras Together with the San, the Damara are one of the oldest nations in Namibia and their origins are unrecorded. This is largely due to their loose social structure, which made them unable to defend themselves against the more unified tribes, dispersing them far and wide and driving them, for the most part, into servitude. Prior to 1800, the Damara occupied most of Namibia as hunter-gatherers and herders of cattle, goats and sheep, skilled in copper work yet unfortunately no match for the dominant cultures who sought to take ownership of their land. During the 19th century, conflict between the Nama and the Herero squeezed the Damara folk out of their settlements, driving them to the hills and many of the Damara people became servants to these stronger tribes. 
In 1960, the South African government set up the Damara Reserve in the northwest of the country but the poor agricultural quality of this settlement did not suit this farming clan and most of them sought work and accommodation in Windhoek, Okahanja, Swakopmund, Walvis Bay, Otavi and Sumeb. Traditionally, the Damara are divided into several tribes, each with its own chief, but are ruled by one monarch. Some of the Damara still own and live on farms, carrying on their traditional ways and have become very rich in cattle and sheep farming. The women fulfill the customary female roles such as household chores and nurturing the children, while the men hunt and care for the livestock. Several have found their niche in public service and, along with other public figures, the president, Hage Gengob Hale from the Damara tribe, tribe. For an insight into the culture and history of these mysterious people, visit the Living Museum of the Damara close to Twyfelfontein. This museum is the only traditional Damara project in Namibia and in the world, attempting to reconstruct the lost culture of the Damara people. Here you will get to witness their interesting traditions, contribute to their welfare and perhaps uncover some of their secrets. Number 9, The Sand People the San people, an indigenous San community, called the Yatosha Panland Lake of a Mother's Tears, representing the depth of grief a mother feels when she loses a child. This is just one tiny drop in the ocean of the beauty and depth of the San culture, a culture of one of the oldest groups of human beings on earth. A culture that would be a great loss to us all if the oral stories, by which the wealth of knowledge of the San is passed on, stopped being told. Fortunately, the elders of the still-surviving community have joined hands with international researchers to form the Itosha Heritage Project. Zams means Itosha Pan in their language. This project aims to document the cultural practices of the San people and to preserve the incredible body of cultural, historical and environmental knowledge. Of special value is the knowledge of the biodiversity of the area. Through this documentation of their oral history, researchers will learn about the medicinal value of various plants as well as the behavior of game in the region. This kind of knowledge will benefit Namibia's conservation efforts, and of course its people. The project also designs and implements projects to create a sustainable livelihood for the people of the region, who have strong historical links with the Atosha Pan. It is part of Namibian conservation policy to ensure that the indigenous people of a conservation area benefit from the tourism and resources that area brings to the country. There is much history that needs to be corrected as the San were forced off their ancestral land in the 1950s and had to eke out a living as farm laborers, sadly they remain one of Namibia's most disadvantaged peoples today. Itosha National Park itself offers so much more than your average Namibian safari. The abundance of wildlife almost pales in comparison with the incredible silvery sand of the Itosha Pan. For those who are interested, born in Itosha, homage to the cultural heritage of the sand tells the story of the culture and the history of the area and its people, better yet, visit Itosha for yourself. Number 10, The Basters. The Basters, also known as Basters, Rehobothers or Rehoboth Basters, are a Namibian ethnic group descended from European settlers and indigenous African women from the Dutch Cape Colony. Since the second half of the 19th century, they have lived in central Namibia, in and around the town of Rehoboth. In ancestral history, they are similar to the groups classified as colored or Griqua people in South Africa. The name Baster is derived from a Dutch word meaning bastard or crossbreed. While some people consider this term demeaning, the basters use it as a proud name, claiming their ancestry and history, treating it as a cultural category in spite of the negative connotation. The community of the Rehoboth basters numbers some 35,000 people, living in an area of 14.216 square kilometers south of Windhoek, the capital of Namibia. They settled in their lands in the early 1870s. They developed their own legislation years before the Germans installed their colonial rule over Namibia in 1885 and as such they constitute an indigenous people in present-day Namibia. The first based baster communities emerged between the Cape Colony's northwestern frontier and the lower course of the Orange River at the end of the 18th century. In the beginning of the 19th century, missionary organizations, such as the London Missionary Society and the Rhenish Missions Jesselschaft established congregations in the territory of the Basters and supported the local communities in developing written forms of regulations that were already in custom for a long period. The Basters were mainly persons of mixed-race descent who at one time would have been absorbed in the white community. 
This term came to refer to an economic and cultural group, and it included the most economically advanced non-white population at the Cape, who had higher status than the natives. Some of the basters acted as supervisors of other servants and were the confidential employees of their white masters. Sometimes, these were treated almost as members of the white family. Many were descended from white men, if not directly from men in the families they worked for. Basters are mostly Calvinist. They sing traditional hymns almost identical to those of the 17th century Netherlands, these songs were preserved in the colony and their group during a period when the Netherlands churches were absorbing new music. The religious fervor of the basters is clear from their motto, Growth in Faith. In 2003 the Council of the Rehoboth Baster Community decided to request the Namibian government to recognize them as a traditional authority. Many peoples in Namibia have such a status which, which grants them a form of self-governance on a local level in which they are able to administer their communal lands as well as provide funds to organize their activities. The lack of communal land, which was confiscated in 1991, however meant that the application by the Rehoboth Basters to be recognized as a traditional authority was denied. Only groups who hold communal land can be recognized as a traditional authority. One hundred years after the Rehoboth Basters rose up against their German colonizers, the photo series Basterland by the German photographer Julia Runge takes up the task of providing a multifaceted insight into the contemporary life of the ethnic group living in Namibia today. A heterogeneous spectrum of images arises in condensed pictures, revealing the tension-laden contradictions inherent to a typical phenomenon of our day and age, the confrontation between the processes of global standardization and traditional regional structures that have been upheld over generations and defended against such external, antagonistic forces. This is a portrait of a society that seems to find itself in an in-between amid tradition and change. It emerges out of the deliberately subjective impressions of the photographer, she, too, is permeated by this in-between, on the one hand because of her repeated visits to the region to become part of the community, on the other hand because of her European heritage, through which she always represents something other. This tension saturates the images throughout the series, some images were partially staged, other, others were created spontaneously. Thus, the very personal questions and emotions that are connected to the photographs are simultaneously expressions of contemporary, fundamental processes, the much-discussed replacement of imperialism by the economic colonization of Africa, but also the reinterpretation of seemingly stable concepts of origin or home terms that have their own particular relevance in connection to the baster's unique history. The virtually constitutive meaning of this history, which has been fought for time and time again, is the central theme of this work, the past lights up in the present, but precisely this past was meant to constantly be protected from the present which in turn, in form of the current state of Namibia, appears to show little interest in the cultural legacy of the baster. Last but not least the merit of this photo series lies in reminding us of a forgotten episode of German colonial history. Number 11, White Namibians. White Namibians are people of European descent settled in Namibia. The majority of white Namibians are Afrikaners, locally born or of white South Africans' descent, with many of the white minority being German Namibians, descended from Germans who colonized Namibia in the late 19th century. Many are also Portuguese or English immigrants. Current estimates of the white Namibian population run between 75,000. The vast majority of white Namibians live in major cities and towns in central or southern Namibia. Windhoek has by far the largest white population, and whites are a majority in the coastal city of Swakopmund. Other coastal cities, such as Walvis Bay and Luteritz, also have large white communities. In general, most of Namibia south of Windhoek has a high proportion of whites, while central Namibia has a high concentration of blacks. Apart from Windhoek, coastal areas and southern Namibia, there are large white communities in Achuarongo and towns in the Otavi Triangle, such as Tsumeb and Grootfontein. The 1981 census of the Republic of South Africa reported a white population of 76,430 in Namibia, 71% Afrikaners and 17% German-speaking. During Namibia's German rule, the colony attracted German immigrants. Most Afrikaners settled during the Dorsland Trek, as well as during the existence of apartheid. Most Angolan-born Portuguese settled after Angola became independent in 1975. 
About 4,000 commercial landowners, mostly whites, own around 50% of the arable land across the country, despite a land reform process. Southwest Africa, white Namibians enjoy the highly privileged position due to apartheid laws enforcing strict segregation.